I think some of the words that we use in everyday life, their meaning is becoming fuzzy through misuse in my opinion. Take a word such as bravery. Apparently now you can be very brave if you're a multi-millionaire footballer talking about the stresses and strains of having to live such a life. Last Sunday marked the 143rd year since the defence of Rogue's Drift. So wonderfully portrayed in that film, one of my favourites, Zulu. In that action, 156 mainly Welsh, Welsh soldiers, 39 of whom were already in hospital, stood against an attack by some 4,000 battle-hardened Zulu warriors. And after that action, the 11 Victoria Crosses were presented, the highest military award for valour. Yet even now, military historians are telling us that really they were misplaced as medals because the, well, the overwhelming odds of the, the opponents to them were such that they, they simply fought for their own life rather than the usual measure which is used for a Victoria Cross, which is the disregard for one's own over the safety or saving of others. Take an element of that bravery and add it to the strength of a mother's love for a child and you form a bond that is unbreakable and immeasurable. Now move forward to another anniversary, to last Thursday, which was Holocaust Memorial Day. The 77th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. We've all heard some of the more moving and harrowing stories about concentration camps, such as Auschwitz, Bergen, Ravensbrück, Dachau. But there was one story that sticks in my mind about Solomon Rosenberg and his family, his wife, their two sons and his mother and father. They were arrested for the crime of being Jews and were taken to Auschwitz. It was an extermination camp and a labour camp, and they were taken to the labour camp, where the rules were simple, as long as you can live, as long as you can work, you will be allowed to live. <coughs> Rosenberg watched as his mother and father were taken off to their deaths because they were too weak to work. And he knew that the next would be his youngest son, David, because David had always been a free <coughs> And every evening, Rosenberg would come back to the barracks after his hours of hard labour and search for the faces of his family. And when he found them, they were clung together, embraced and thanked God for another day of life. One day he came back and he couldn't see those familiar faces. He finally, finally found his eldest son, Joshua, huddled in a corner. He told his father that his brother had not been strong enough to do his work, so they had come for him. But where's your mother? asked Rosenberg. Joshua told him that when they came for David, he was afraid and he cried. His mother told him there was nothing to be afraid of, took his hand and went with him. Something impossible to define. A mother's love that was so strong that she would willingly sacrifice her life to comfort her child. There are so many stories like this which show the very powerful bond that exists between a mother and a son and daughter. And that story reminded me of the bond that existed between Mary and Joseph and their son Jesus. Now I suppose it's here that I, as some of you know, for very personal reasons, I, I find it difficult to talk about the difficulties that Mary had to go through to carry her son Jesus. So I won't subject you to the story I once tried to talk about the Shepherd's Dean. And those of you who were there will know what I mean. Just months before our Gospel reading today, Mary and Joseph were starting to plan their wedding and look forward to beginning their married lives together. Then those plans were rudely interrupted by an angel who delivered some startling news. Mary was to have a baby, the Son of God, Saviour of the world. And from that moment when Mary said to Gabriel, Here am I, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. She risked everything, including her life, had not Joseph agreed to marry her. Just as Mary and Joseph began to prepare for the birth of their son, came the mandate of the Roman government that forced them to make a 70 mile journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem, where Mary had given birth to Jesus in less than ideal circumstances. 
The humble faith that Mary and Joseph had already demonstrated in so many different ways continues here. They simply did as God asked of them, and that continued as they travelled to the temple in Jerusalem. And yes, I know this reading is very much about Simeon and Anna, but it's also very much about Mary and Joseph. Joseph and Mary take Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to God as was the tradition and was written in the law. It also marks the 40th day after Christmas when Mary has completed her 40 days of purification after the birth of her son, which is marked by Candlemas, the significance of that being that Jesus is the light of the world. So they went to offer a sacrifice, which is also stated in the law. It wasn't a very long trip from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, about five miles. But it was here that they encountered Simeon, a man we are told was righteous and devout, and was looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And two things fascinate me about that encounter. Firstly, that Simeon is at the temple at exactly the right time to meet the couple and the baby Jesus. God had made a promise to this man, and God led him on the exact day and at the exact moment that Mary and Joseph came to the temple. So many times in our Bible we read where God leads his people to the right place at the right time. Abraham went to the right part of the mountain and found a ram. Noah followed God's direction and was protected from the flood. Elijah went to the brook and was fed by ravens. What would have happened if they hadn't obeyed? Simeon would have missed out on the promise given to him by God. The second thing is that here we have Jesus, a tiny baby a few weeks old, and yet as Joseph and Mary arrive, Simeon immediately takes the baby in his arms and says, Master, you are now dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for the glory of your people Israel. And even in this early stage of her baby's life, Mary receives the first indication of what lies ahead for her son and for herself, when Simeon tells her, that her child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that he will be opposed so that inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Simeon has summarised in these few words what lay in store for the short life of Jesus to come, and the pain his mother was to suffer. It wasn't such a coincidence for Anna to be there at this time, since being widowed after seven short years of marriage, she's lived in the temple as now 84 years old. She immediately recognises what Simeon has seen in the baby and began to praise God and speak about the child, who all were looking for the redemption of Israel. Simeon saw and knew for sure that God had not forgotten God's people. He saw and knew for sure that God is love and that no matter what life may throw at us now, life is more than worth the living and salvation is more than worth the wait. And so in peace, Simeon died knowing that his life was not in vain. Now Simeon and Anna were both extreme examples of what it can mean to be called by God and it's rare that God's calling is so dramatic. It can and does, however, happen in a much less demanding way. I am convinced that God led me through my mother's funeral to this church. <coughs> some of us may be waiting for someone or something to reveal to us that there's meaning and more to give in this life. We may be waiting for the assurance that we are not just here by chance, that we are not alone, that hatred, hardship and death do not have the final word. All we have to do is to have patience, to wait for that still, small voice that will come and will lead us to where we need to be. Amen. Amen.